Elise Cormier is going to be here with us this afternoon and I'm, I'm so excited because Elise does wonderful work. She reaches out to schools, schoolyards, churches. We saw beautiful things on her website and I know she's going to tell us all about them and I, and I know you, not only you garden club members, but you master gardeners. That's what you do in your neighborhoods is help these school children. So we're really excited about Elise. She's a landscape architect in the Atlanta area and we're just so glad that she came down to South Georgia to be with us today. So please welcome Elise Cormier. talk with y'all about native plants. I find them very easy to love and um, I actually went to see native plants on my honeymoon. I dragged my husband down to Crooked River State Park to see the lonely pine trees and um, he's here with me today on our fifth anniversary to join us at the Native Plants I'm a big fan of native plants and I find them very easy to love and so I know y'all are all here because you love native plants too. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about me but also tell you some ways that you can take all this great information you heard this morning from Derek about beautiful trees that we can use in landscape and from Jennifer about the ball gardens and how to apply those to create spaces in your own homes, um, in your schools and civic places that you volunteer at around the town. So this is, this is my company, Smart Landscapes. We're based in Atlanta. Um, and we work with everyone from schools putting in nature-based playgrounds to get kids back to nature because that's a big deal these days. Um, we also work with historic sites and help them integrate um, native plants in a beautiful way into these historic properties. And we also do things like design um, bike trails. Maybe you all have heard of the Beltline or the Silver Comet. We do that kind of work too. So today, I wanted to walk you through why natives. I think a lot of you already know the answer to this question, but I wanted to give you a little bit more depth to think about. Um, and then talk about some best in show for South Georgia. And then when I think of gardens, I think of spaces where people live their lives, where they enjoy an event or some sort of activity. And so I've got five different party plans for you. And then we've got some resources. And so here's my website here at the bottom of the page. And after today, there'll be some uh, downloadable resource pages where y'all can get all the information I talk about today. So you don't have to worry about taking a bunch of notes or scribbling, just relax and enjoy. Um, and then y'all can visit the website later this week and download that information. So when I think about gardens, I think about pretty places. I think about places that make me feel good. I walked outside at lunch today because there's some beautiful um, areas around this building and it's just lovely to walk through them. And these are places where people connect. You see each other, you visit, you also connect with birds and butterflies and nature. And you get to visit all your favorite plants. But when we talk about native gardens, we're talking about not just pretty gardens, but pretty smart gardens. So I think about when I was a kid and I went to my grandmother's house and she was a cooker. How many of y'all had a grandmother that cooked everybody's favorite food? Okay. <laughs> so this is what native plant gardens do. It's everybody's favorite food. It's not just, you know, one type of meat. It's not just a side of broccoli. It's the whole thing. It's the pork chops, it's the butter beans, it's everything. Tomatoes, whatever you want. So this is what native plant gardens offer. They offer complexity. Also, housing choices. We all like choices. We all like to figure out different places to live. There's different kinds of birds and butterflies in your gardens. And they all want to live in a slightly different place. Um, they also want to get, get out of the way when they need to and hide and have refuge. And we also need that. So gardens provide refuge for us as well. But I also like the part of insurance. Now, y'all work really hard on your gardens. How many of y'all have been out past dark digging in the ground? <laughs> How many of y'all bought way too many plants today? <laughs> so when you get home and you plant all those things, you're going to hope they make it. And native plants give you a better insurance policy than that. I love this picture. It's about 
prairie garden ecology, and look at that root system. You don't need to know what all these plants are, but just look at that root system. That's your insurance policy. It's for you, for that hard work you spend, you know, after dinner putting all the plants in the ground and making sure everything got in just right. And it's also the insurance for the soil. So this keeps your garden in place. Do you all see where the lawn grass is on that picture? <laughs> That's not a lot of insurance. See why you gotta water it all the time? So, and we know in South Georgia there's some beautiful places to visit, like Providence Canyon over near Lumpkin. Um, and and this, is a, this is an instance of not using your root system to your advantage. So that's how Providence Canyon formed. I'm sure you all know this story being from this part of the state uh, with, the, with the soil just washing right away. So we, we have the responsibility to take care of these places. Okay, elephant in the room. Why not natives? How many of y'all have friends who go, I don't want that thing in my yard. I'm going to buy this camellia or this beautiful azalea or you know, some kind of privet that, that I find very easily at Lowe's or Home Depot. Well, that's the thing. Sometimes they're hard to find. And today we've heard a lot of resources of, that where you can buy your native plants. Um, symposiums like this are great ways to do that. There's also a lot of mail order options these days, and those are perfectly reasonable. I know it's sometimes strange to buy something online and have it show up and be this living plant, but that's a great way to go. Sometimes we talk about them being hard to use with your existing ornamentals. So maybe you want to buy some native plants, but then you say, I'm going to blend this with my traditional landscape. So we'll talk about some tips for that when we get to the party planning. But if you're going to mix and match with your traditional landscapes, try to steer clear <laughs> these three. There's a lot of invasive plants, and some of them I am also personally attached to, like you are. And I grew up, you know, getting nectar out of honeysuckle, and I grew up very emotionally attached to mimosa because I thought it was a native plant of the South. It was part of my Southern heritage. So the way I deal with that emotion is I just don't plant anymore. Um, and then Chinese tallow tree, great fall, fall color, also popcorn tree. How many of y'all have seen these around Tifton? Or, and great fall color. But I'm going to show you a couple other plants that also would be great fall color. I wanted to mention a little resource out there on the table there. This uh, homeowner's guide for prevention of invasive species, and it's got some great tips for you. I'm, I won't belabor this anymore, but um, just be aware as you go along. Another reason people don't like those natives is they're not showy. They look kind of weedy. So this picture here, this is a well-intentioned rain garden. So we got a beautiful plan off the internet, maybe from the county extension agency, maybe, and they set out these plants. And three months in on this rain garden, their husband's looking for the weed whacker. <laughs> so we've got a conflict of interest. We're trying to help the birds and butterflies. We're trying to be responsible with our stormwater runoff. But we got something that's not very showy. So this is really about poor design. About, and we're going to talk about how to arrange your plants so you get a really good look. But also, some of these plants just aren't showy no matter where you put them. But that's okay. Because native plants, the benefit is they attract the show to your garden. So that's something that you can't get from a traditional landscape in the abundance that you can get from a native plant garden. So here we have a really pretty goldfinch. And he's eating, does anyone know what that plant is? Oh. Purple cone kind of plant. So when I was a graduate student in North Carolina State, I loved riding my bike to school every day. And I would ride past a whole bed of coneflower in a Black Eyed Susan, and in the fall, these guys, it would just be 20 or 30 flocking over that space. And it was just gorgeous. I mean, those flowers were pretty, but when they faded, you got to see all of these yellow <coughs> birds coming and going. And the other thing about native plants is they've got a cultural tradition for us. We've, we've got a long history connected to these plants. Um, you know, from everything from making May Hall jelly to, uh, I, I stayed at a lovely bed and breakfast near Tai Tai last night and got a, a jar of muscadine jelly for breakfast. Um, so this is, this is something that's part of who we are. So let's talk about a best in show. When we talk about these native plants, we want to talk about maybe the showiest collection we can use in South Georgia. And there are hundreds of plants. So I picked a few that I think will go pretty well in these five different garden party settings. Um, they've got seasonal interest. They work in a variety of places, 
and they're really fun for both wildlife and for people. And I've broken them down into three categories so we can think about them in terms of sizes. Um, so I come from a design perspective and as opposed to a horticulture perspective. I really enjoy brushing up on my horticulture this morning. Um, and so I think of gardens as places where people interact and I think of them in terms of dimensions and height. And so that's how I've organized my plants for you. This might help you as well. So when we talk about the tall things, I'm thinking about, you know, long leaf pines, major trees. You're going to need this in that hot Georgia sun. Um, you need something shady. Long leaf pine, how many of y'all have this? Grow it where you are. It's like quite a few, okay. Native pine of South Georgia all the way up to um, Virginia, Florida, all the way across to Texas. Um, I used to work for the Nature Conservancy, and this was one of the reasons I was hired, was to help them restore this uh, major swath of where the longleaf pine used to grow. And just a very complex ecosystem, including some adorable little uh, warblers that are associated with these plants. A tulip poplar, a signature symposium tree. Wonderful plant. Honeybees love it. Hummingbirds love it. It's got lots of insects that live up in that canopy, and the hummingbirds fly through there and get the nectar, but they also feed on some of the insects. So very, very dynamic tree. Great flowers, too. Black gum. Do any of y'all have a black gum? I really like these. I think that fall color is gorgeous, and they have very significant wild, wildlife value with the blueberries in the fall. And the blueberries, they get eaten up so fast that you just get to see the bird show, and you don't actually get any of the mess falling around. And then swamp chestnut oak. Oak trees host so many butterfly and moth species. It's just incredible. So if you like butterflies, this is the way to go. Um, they also have all of those acorns that fall, and then just this tree itself is a habitat for a lot of plants. So oak trees in general are the number one plant for wildlife in North America. So then we've got our shade layer going. And then how many of y'all are sick of seeing all those trunks of pine trees and you wish you had some color in the winter? <laughs> this is where we start to take care of that. So if we're thinking about things maybe as tall as a dogwood, about a little bit higher than the roof line of your house. And this would uh, start to bring in some color in between all those tree trunks. We got the sweet bay magnolia. Uh, did any of y'all smell these flowers before? What, what, uh, what do you think they smell like? Mag magnolia, yeah. <laughs> Lemony, maybe? There's a parking deck near my house, and when you walk across the top of it, the sweet bay magnolias have grown up, and you're right there at the flower level, and you can smell them. Then sumac. This is the staghorn sumac. And to me, this is like one of those Dr. Seuss trees. You know, the trees in all those Dr. Seuss books, they're kind of quirky looking, and they got a little puffball top, and they do funky things. To me, this is that tree. It brings an element of play into your landscape. It's got this brilliant color, and if any of y'all like chickadees, this is a great little plant for chickadees. You can also, um, when we talk about cultural uses, you can take that, um, that little seed cone and soak it in water, and it tastes like lemonade. Now, that's just for staghorn sumac. Don't go do it with the poison sumac. <laughs> <laughs> it works with wing sumac, too. Yep, so the sumac family gets a bad rap because of the poison sumac. But that's just one of many. So. Um, and you really can't beat that fall color. The silver bell. Does anyone have a silver bell? Yes. And do you love it with those white flowers? I think this would be gorgeous in a fairy garden. If you had a little granddaughter and she came out and saw those little silver bells, almost the size of ping pong, not quite that big. Just gorgeous in the spring. And then, of course, we have sassafras. I saw a little grove starting right out here in front of the native plant sale, those little grove of sassafras coming in. And those are just so fun for kids. When I was little and I would go camping, my brother and I would go and get ourselves some sassafras twigs and we'd make the tea. But we also loved how you could get three different leaves off the same tree. You can't do that with so many plants. And they all smell good, too. Also a good one for fall color. Okay, so we filled in all those tree trunks. Now we need something that's about table height that you can look at. Let's say you're sitting at the patio table and you're glancing over to the side. You want something that's right at eye level that you're looking at. That possum hog. Does anyone have a possum hog? Do you like it pretty well? 
is still young. They get these gorgeous uh, red berries all over. So it's one of our native hollies. It drops its leaves in the winter, and then you just get it blanketed with uh, those berries. But we talked about native plant gardens being beauty and brains. They're not just pretty, they also are functional for you and for wildlife. So we get these cardinals eaten off of them all winter and attracting a show um, that you can see from the kitchen window. We also had giant cane. Some people don't really think about giant cane very often. It's actually an incredible wildlife resource. It's uh, wonderful for caterpillars. It's very good for refuge and nesting. You can use it to uh, build your garden, which is actually pretty helpful. I had a great visit at um, our Divine Savior Catholic Church yesterday here in Tifton with Vicki Lovers and her daughter, Michaela. And uh, they've got a great use of some of the um, giant cane for doing the screening on, at their prayer garden. There's a prayer garden starting up there. Button bush. I think this plant is just incredible. When I first saw it in the wild, I thought it was something escaped from a nursery. I just couldn't believe it, it was just a regular old Georgia native plant. Um, wonderful for these swallowtail butterflies. Um, and excellent along streams. We talked about bog gardens this morning. That's a great fit for this plant. And of course, beauty berry. Some of y'all might be over beauty berry, but when I was little, my number one ingredient for mud pies was beauty berries. <laughs> <laughs> They're terrific. They really show up with the place they end really well. They also smell good. So there we filled in that middle layer. So we've got our shade, we've got some color amongst all the pine trees, and now we've filled in that shrub layer, so you know, right around hip high. Now let's start talking about the ground layer. This is really the detail where you can add some personality to your own landscape. So hibiscus, I love this plant. I mean, picture walking out as a little kid into someone's garden and seeing a flower as big as your whole head. I mean, that's an incredible flower right there. I think a lot of times with perennials, um, you know, we, we think about them in their best light. We don't think about the winter looks. So I want to go ahead and put that picture on there so you can see what it looks like in the winter. Um, and that's really not a bad look. It's also going to be attracting all those birds coming in, you know, the winter migrants coming in and eating those little seed pods. Same thing for goldenrod. Goldenrod's the middle mix in that lower picture. And so you see it in the winter garden, still providing some wildlife value, but also some texture. You've got, you know, a lot of frothy looking plants in there, which is interesting to look at when the frost gets on it, or even it's just when it's blowing in the gentle winter wind. But that massive color. So one design thing about, native, about using native plant perennials, it's sort of like Costco. You go there and you buy in volume. You don't just buy the one, you come home with a whole case of something. So that's how you work it with native plant perennials. You buy a lot of them. Um, and I saw some woodland flocks in, um, in, this, in last year's awards garden too. It's, and this is a wonderful plant. It smells good, nice blue color. And then false indigo. I think this is another one of those Dr. Seuss plants, especially when those seed pods start coming out in the fall and it's got some very interesting shapes to it. Very bold looking plant and also one that you don't get to transplant once you get it in the ground. Has anyone tried digging up a, a blue indigo or moving it? They don't transplant very easily. They like where they want to be. So, so we've got those showy, but now we're going to talk about the really short stuff. And I saw some of these Anamasca lilies out of the plant cell. Did anyone buy any of them today? Oh, good. And that's, see, some of these native plants you want to buy in bulk, but some will just spread, and you just buy one or two, and you end up with a whole field of them, and that's part of the beauty of this. So we've got this rain lily, and uh, the first time I saw those down in Moody Forest, um, more or less near uh, Broxton in Douglas area, um, I was just amazed at them. I mean, we just don't get those up in Atlanta. I mean, it's really one of those treasures of South Georgia. And pink muley grass is the same. It started to become very widespread, um, and I'm sure many of you have that one in the garden. But that fall color is just spectacular. Now, I have a hard time selling this to clients in Atlanta when their husbands are present because their husbands don't want a bunch of pink stuff in their yard. <laughs> but I point out that it's just like an azalea just in the fall. It's maybe one or two weeks and then it goes away and turns back to regular grass again. And so if you can live through that azalea, you can live through the pink muley and just park down the street and whatever you need to do for those two weeks. And it's looking good in that top picture with the tulip poplar. 
uh, which, which is, you know, we've always mentioned is already good for, for uh, bees. The bees come to the uh, flowers and it's the number one honey tree. Also good for hummingbirds. Southern wood fern. I love these ferns because they just spread out. They just, and Amy loves these. Any, anyone else have the southern wood fern in their garden? You've got a lot of good, I'm going to visit your garden. <laughs> yeah, this one is just a spectacular plant. Um, and it really works in a lot of different soil types. And then finally, dog hobble. I really enjoy this one because it works in public parks. Um, it works in hot, dry places, but it mostly likes to be along stream banks um, in the woods. Uh, so it's very good if you've got a low area. And the nice thing about it is it gives you that evergreen color. So it's going to stay green in the winter, too. So there we've sort of laid out from high to low a little collection of best in show plants to talk about. We've got everything from the longleaf pine and the tulip poplar, that uh, black gum, and the swamp chestnut oak, and then filling in below that with the possum haw and the silver bell, and the sweet bay magnolia, the uh, river cane coming in, uh, the giant cane coming in, and then um, the staghorn sumac with the sassafras, giving you some really good fall color. And then at that lower level, where you're going to get a lot of detail, and you can see this right at the eye level. You've got the button bush and the hibiscus, both attracting butterflies. The golden rod, which can get pretty tall, so sometimes I put it in with the shrubs. And the beauty berry and the dog hobble. And then right at that ground level, where you want some color and something to cover up all that pine straw mulch, uh, you've got the Adamasco lily and the pink muley grass, the woodland phlox, southern wood fern, and that baptisia, the false indigo. Um, that false indigo also comes in yellow and white, which is, makes for a nice combination. I like that blue the best. So what do we do with all those plants? We all come to these shows, we see a million different plants, we buy two or three of this or that, and we get home and we go, well, I don't know what to do now. So this is where we're going to talk design. Um, and I think of arranging a garden like I plan a party. Um, and with this being my fifth wedding anniversary, I think back to my wedding, we had to pick a venue, figure out who was going to uh, come to this thing, what the theme was going to be like. But you can also make that a smaller thing where you really think about a backyard barbecue or even if you want to plan a um, children's garden. You can always start with a theme. Um, and since that Great Gatsby movie came out a couple years ago, this Jazz Age lawn party has been pretty popular. So you get a theme, then you pick a venue that's going to make that theme work out. You figure out who you're going to invite. In our case, we really want you know, birds and butterflies as well as people. We want native habitat as well as um, all of our family and neighbors to come. And then most importantly, when you plant a garden, what are people going to do when they're there? you got to give them something to do or they'll do whatever they want. And we know we don't want that. And my favorite part, where they want to eat. So this is really where we start catering to wildlife. So when we think about venue, we're really thinking about soil. And again, there's a great brochure out there, and this is a perfect campus for learning about soil, but this water and soil resources will help you get started. I'm sure some of y'all have done the soil testing with UGA. So raise your, raise your hands if you've done that. Okay, so y'all, if you haven't done that, these people with their hands raised can tell you how, but that's a whole great subject to learn about pH with the bog garden and what a difference that can make. You also want to talk about sun. And in South Georgia, we're talking about the southwest afternoon sun. If you can make it through that, you can make any plant live. So, um, and then the water regime. This has much to do with where the water is already flowing. Uh, like Jennifer talked about, putting in that bog garden at the base of a rain spout, a down spout, and how the bog garden washed out. Where your water is flowing is going to determine how successful that space is going to be. So the way I like to figure that out is I put on my rain jacket when it's raining and I walk around and I look at where the water's flowing and it's easy peasy because it just it's like having the cheat the cliff notes right there with you when you're taking the test and so um, that's what I do plus it's kind of fun <laughs> and then the other thing is look, most of the time when we have some kind of venue some place we want to put a garden let's say it's our backyard let's say we want to dress up the front entrance to our house maybe our church needs someone to volunteer and create some sort of uh, prayer spot um, Something's already there. And so being attentive to what's already growing there, maybe working with it, if it's an invasive plant, maybe doing something about that. But also think about what kind of wildlife is already going through. 
work with what's already happening, because you might be surprised how much is already taking place, and you can just move right along with it. So that's our venue. And then we talk about who do we want to invite. This has a lot to do with the plants that we put in there. We talk about native plant gardens being beauty and brains. They are very complex places. So if we have our guest list, we basically plant stuff that birds like to eat, and they show up. Uh, we also want to invite our family and friends in there, and so that's when we decide how do we design these spaces so it's comfortable for the people. So we're going to talk through five different party themes. We've got a shady patio space, which will get you through those hot afternoons, a sunny front yard, which we want more of a formal entry, and you can apply this to some civic space that you want to have a nice look, like let's say you're taking care of a, a corner um, for a gateway to Tifton or something like that. A bog garden, and this might be combined with rain gardens or how you deal with a dry stream bed in your yard. And also a prayer garden, which can also be a healing garden or a meditation space. And my favorite, the children's gardens, uh, which are very active, entertaining places. So those are our themes. When we talk about designing a successful garden space and working with what's already there, we really think about pine trees, at least I think a lot about pines when I think of South Georgia. And these pines providing this evergreen backdrop and really being your canvas. So sometimes people say, well, I just can't stand those. But if you flip it around and start thinking about how they can serve as a backdrop for all these colorful layers that we've talked about wanting to add from the Bestman Show. And then also the wilder a space, rule of thumb is the wilder a space, the tamer the edge. So if you want to have some sort of wildflower meadow in your front yard and you don't want your neighbors to come over and knock on your door and offer to have their kid mow it for you, put a nice clean edge on that. Put a pretty brick border and maybe mow right down by the street. And then people will say, oh, it's not an abandoned house. <laughs> Someone lives there. And the other trick is you can get one of those um, Audubon Backyard Wildlife Sanctuary signs or from the National Wildlife Federation, put that out in your yard. And then everybody knows what to deal with. And you get brownie points for being a good citizen and all that. <laughs> My other favorite one is give things place room to grow. Don't go crowding up your walkways. So uh, a lot of times people will come up and say, well, is this the right time of year to prune my hydrangea? Well, no, because you planted it in the wrong spot. You don't have to prune it if you put it in the right spot. So make sure you get plenty of room to where you're going to walk around, because it helps people feel comfortable. You're creating a space for wildlife and for people, and you want people to be comfortable. Um, paying attention to those pretty views. So this is where that river cane comes in. It's great for screening out stuff you don't want to look at, but if you screen something out, you're focusing the eye somewhere else. And then that view is really what you want to keep your eye on. And then keeping everything watered. Sometimes, do y'all do the native plant rescues? The George Native Plant Society up in Atlanta does these native plant rescues. Do y'all do them down here too? No, not so much? Okay. Well, that's, that's an event where people run out to a site that's going to be developed with the permission of the developer, and they dig up a bunch of plants and take them to some sort of park or other area that is being beautified and adopted. The trick is keeping all that stuff watered. So sometimes it, it's good to phase it in over time, so then you don't have to figure out how to water all those places. And that also fits in um, with, with working where the water flows are already going. That really helps a lot, too. So the last design tip I'm going to discuss as we go through the five different gardens is the hardscape pairing. So you always have a wine and cheese pairing or you know, chips and salsa. Well, this is your hardscape to go with your landscape. And so that needs to blend and match with the type of garden feel that you're going for. So we'll talk through some of those as we go. All right, how many of y'all have a patio garden? No? Well, now's your time to learn how to do them. <laughs> so this garden is in Australia, and that's why you don't recognize any of the plants. But I like it because it shows those sticks. That can be your silver bell that's grown underneath your longleaf pine and giving you that nice dappled shade. But the silver bell is short enough to where it'll block that hot afternoon sun. So you need something short but that you can still see through to block that hot afternoon sun. You want a lot of fragrance and detail. Um, you want some evening color, because most, most of this maybe are in our gardens during the evenings, sometimes in the morning. 
maybe on a Saturday afternoon. And then you want something short on the, on the ground layer, layer that can just be real simple. So you want something real simple, no nonsense in this space, because it's mostly about entertaining. Maybe you have people over do a cookout. So if you've gone and put those plants in your garden, who have you invited? What guests have you brought over? Well, apparently you've invited a fox to your patio garden. <laughs> so that's maybe not bad if you find foxes interesting. Um, but and, and so those beauty berries are an attractive food source for some of the smaller mammals. Other mammals might be raccoons or possums. Um, and I wasn't so keen on possums in the garden until I found out how many palmetto bugs they eat a day. And I don't like palmetto bugs in the garden. So I'm willing to go with the possum over that. <laughs> and then you also end up with really, because of that ground cover layer with the dog hobble, you end up with some real nice uh, quail and songbirds coming through. And that's fascinating to look at when you're sitting in the garden. So let's take a look at that formal sunny front yard. Uh, this picture is from a, a residence in Atlanta that I worked with. And we like to do these before and after pictures so people know what they're getting themselves into. And so that top is what it used to look like. So that's what your house looks like now. Have hope. It gets better. And so this ending part, uh, we, taught, we added in some structure. There's some nice, formal, clean, neat edges. So when I was talking about if you want to have that wildlife habitat in your front yard and you don't want to scare your neighbors, put in a nice, clean brick border. And then they've got all these native plants. But it's, it's not crazy color. It's just a little bit of color, and you want to focus it in key places, like down near the mailbox or up near the front door. And that hardscape is very formal. So our hardscape pairing here, where before we had, you know, some mulch surfaces, some nice, you know, uh, un maybe some flagstone or pavers that were set in sand. Here we've got something that's mortared, it's sturdy, it's not going anywhere. So some plants that would be great here might be that tulip poplar, which would be tall and give you some fall color. The Sweet Bay Magnolia, it'll give you evergreen structure. It'll look good in the winter just like it does in the summer. And then the Possum Paw will give you those bright, bright red berries in the winter. And then just a little bit of color two different times a year, that pink muley and then the false indigo. So when we think about that, you know, we've, we've invited the family over to Sunday dinner, but who else have we invited to be in this space with us? We've got those great ladybugs those really beneficial insects. So if you have a plant like that blue indigo that attracts a bunch of aphids, the ladybugs will show up to eat them. And that's helpful, because then you've got a plant that's, detract, that's, that's attracting the aphids away from your squash in the backyard, and you've got ladybugs showing up to, to help out with that job. You also get a ton of songbirds, which is always nice when you pull in the drive at the end of the day to see the, see the show of the songbirds. So when we talk about the bog garden, uh, you know, we're really talking more about a series of different kinds of water gardens. We, with the bog garden might be a connecting place with something like a rain garden, or what this picture actually is, is one of those natural swimming pools, which I think of maybe as a snake habitat, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I like the idea of a non-chlorinated swimming area, and I would watch from the dock up there and enjoy that. <laughs> But this is all the rage now. We went from chlorinated to salt water to natural. And I think this is, they got these at the river, and that works well for me. I'm fine swimming in the river. Uh, but this kind, of, this kind of garden, it's got big leaves. It's got spiky stuff. It's got lots of texture, different size plants um, and, and spiky and round things. So that level of texture really makes it really energized. And then that smooth plane of the water in between is a nice contrast to all that. You also want really defined edges. So your hardscape pairings with this kind of place, you want that dock. Because we all feel a little bit uncomfortable maybe thinking about what might be in that water or how do we get out of it. But then we also want something that looks very natural like this little gravel in the front. So this might be a great ending to a downspout. You have your gutter system on your house and it runs through a little dry stream bed and then it comes out to a place like this. It doesn't have to be as fancy as this or as big. This is, you know, one of those high-end residential places that I did not design. Uh, but this would be a good, good place for that swamp chestnut oak. It would give you um, some light shade and a ton of wildlife value. So we're talking luna moths, which I think are just gorgeous. And then on the edge of that, 
water area, you can end up with some of the button bush. Uh, and then at the ground level, do the hibiscus, that big red flower, and some of the Adamasco lily that will naturalize around that garden. So once again, we're talking about what shows up when we design these kind of places. So we've got a ton of butterflies in this thing area. Wild turkey also might come strolling through your yard, which could be interesting, and it might be helpful if you happen to have some hunters in the family <laughs> and live out of town. But also water birds. I mean, if you have children in your life, um, having them come out and see little water birds coming through is a pretty big deal. And a ton of songbirds, still wonderful. And then you see a little collection of flowers. I mean, that's a significant number of flowers in that small space. So how many of y'all have a prayer garden or have visited one? It's a pretty good number. And so if y'all if y'all are interested in seeing one right here in Tifton, um, Vicki, would you raise your hand? Okay. Vicki has been working on a prayer garden, as I mentioned, and it's starting out. It's just beginning. Um, but she's gone and gotten some lovely uh, seedlings from the uh, Arbor Day Foundation. And that's a great way. We heard from Derek this morning about all the different troubles you can have planting trees and, and how to avoid that. And Vicki managed to get some seedlings from the Arbor Day Foundation, and they're so little. But that means you just dig a little hole, and then they grow really fast. And Michaela saw them too. And then it's time to go home to your patio garden and have a cocktail. I'm done in no time. So these prayer gardens are places where you go to restore your spirit. You want to have them be quiet places. You want them to be reflective, have really pretty views that you can look at. Very simple color scheme. You don't want to get overstimulated. It's, uh, it's not like you know some, some sort of uh, festival space where you want to have lots of different color and action. You want a quiet place. You also want a place where you can transition into it, some kind of gateway. So this is a, a, a healing garden, actually. This plan here is the healing garden we designed um, in the Decatur area of Atlanta, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago now. But the, the front area is sort of your arrival place. It is bright and sunny and very invigorating. And then as you start to move towards the back of the property, you go through a gateway, which helps you transition mentally into a very quiet space as a very simple color scheme. Some great colors for a healing or a prayer garden are blues, whites, very pale yellows. Um, mostly blue and white and purples would really be where you'd want to stay. Um, and that rest area in the back has really pretty views out into that meadow area. So that's the kind of thing you want in your prayer garden. You want a focal point that changes seasonally. Um, and you want to uh, have, have the outside world screened out. So right away, I think of that river cane. It's abundant, it grows quickly, it spreads. If you get too much of it, you can use it to build your gateway. Think about the black gum tree with the red fall color and the silver bell with the white flowers in the spring. Great focal points. You just get one of them. Put them out there, and that's just something to, to look at and think about. And then you want some kind of very simple texture on the ground plane. So that woodland phlox with its purple color, it just spreads along. It's not demanding, very light fragrance. And then the southern wood fern um, has a very calming texture to it as well. So we thought about how the people feel in this space. Once again, let's look at how the critters are feeling. So imagine yourself sitting on this bench in this prayer garden, framed by the rustling of the river cane around you. And a little cottontail bunny comes out of the river cane and hops across the path and maybe eats a large portion of the woodland flocks. <laughs> but that's nice. It distracts you from the stresses in your life. It's, I mean, they're harm it's not going to eat you. It's just going to eat the woodland flocks. It's very pleasant. And then you have a little, a little collection of very colorful birds. These warblers are just spectacular. I like that picture in particular because it's sitting on a pine branch. A lot of warblers really enjoy being around pine trees. So that's something that we can think about when we think about the, the pine trees being ubiquitous in this landscape. And that butterfly is one of my favorites. That's the gray hair streak. Tiny little butterfly. And it loves the river cane. And we also think about the bluebirds and the white-eyed vireo. Those are all great songbirds that would love to be in this place. So you think about 
this prayer garden, you've created a quiet place, but then you have these tiny little colorful birds all flitting around that area. So, total opposite of a prayer garden might be a children's garden, where you have hordes of screaming people <laughs> picking up everything, you know, raising plants, whole, whole roots and all right out of the ground to investigate them, tearing up and down paths, climbing over everything, totally oblivious to a planting scheme. And that would be a children's garden. <laughs> this one uh, is a design we did for Bullock Hall, which is an historic property in Roswell, Georgia. And it doubles as a wedding venue, although I think it's mostly going to be an outdoor classroom. But you see there's a variety of textures. That ground is a bone path. But then there's also that dock, so it's with some very formal edges, just like we did with the bog garden earlier. Um, there's, there's some uh, gravel paths as well that go through. And then there's a whole variety of colors and, and environments. So this is like a collection of the four gardens we saw before, all plopped in one. So you can do your little test, test plots at home, and then you go out and volunteer for the local school and you can do this. So the great thing about uh, a children's garden is there's lots of seed pods, there's lots of flowers, it's a very touchable place, it sparks the imagination. You definitely want to have a lot of life cycle plants. So can they uh, see a caterpillar grow up and then the butterfly come through over here? And you want to have a lot of fragrance and sound. I'm thinking about that river cane making the rustling noise, the fragrance. We have a lot, we've got the woodland phlox has a nice fragrance. We've also got the sweet bad magnolia. So which plants would you want to put in there? So the big thing with the children's garden is you want to put something that doesn't have thorns. You really just want to minimize the hazards. And you want to put something that's not toxic. So when we look at our best of show list, we want everything except for the possum haw, because kids love to put stuff in their mouth. And we want everything but the false indigo and the Adamasco lily. So everything else on that list is great for this. And we'll have some more resources on our website if y'all when it um, work on a children's garden, we all can avoid some of the toxic plants and really go for the ones that are big crowd pleasers and can handle some rough attention. If you eat a lot of those berries, it'll hurt you. So it's in the holly family, so we think about the Yopon holly um, and how those berries were traditionally used by the Native Americans for uh, purging exercises. And so the, the possum hog will do something similar. You have to eat a lot of them. But somebody might have a long recess or something. <laughs> we don't know what they're doing. And the false indigo, those seed pods are toxic. And the Adamasco lily, you just don't want to eat any of that. Um, but I think the most attractive would be that possum hog for Red berries, kids are drawn to those. So just steal kill with, red, with the red berries. So we've got a lot of plant choices for this kind of space. And it ends up attracting any number of guests to this kind of a party. You know, we've got the cottontails, which I just can't imagine what kid wouldn't squeal with delight over seeing a little rabbit go through. Ladybugs, endlessly fascinating. Tons of birds, tons of butterflies, hummingbirds zipping around. This is a great place for a kid to learn about the natural world. These are the kind of places that a lot of times we get asked to help design and build for our local schools or for a local nature center. And they can be as big or little as we want. So when we think about these native plant gardens, we've gone through a series of places where they're, they're gardens that function both for people, but they also function for the natural systems. They're, we really talked about a full layering of plants. So we have uh, the shady canopy of the longleaf pine. We've got that mixed end of the silver bell growing in the mid-range about as high as your roof. Things that are about as high as a patio table, like the beauty berry. And then that ground level cover, like the southern wood fern. And putting all those plants together in the right combinations can give you really, really nice spaces to enjoy, where you invite people and nature to these parties. And it makes your experience a lot richer, too, for enjoying watching these um, critters flit around and knowing that you're helping out with these spaces. So I want to invite you to look in your notebooks, in your little brochures that you got, the, the folders you got with this conference. And there's a nice little flyer here that uh, helps you get started a little bit on some native plants for birds and for butterflies. 
and we'll be adding this to our website along with some other resources that we talked about today. So later this week, this is where you can visit to learn about that. My favorite part on here is the five field trips to see native plants. So these are the ones that I've dragged my husband to on all of our major milestones as a couple. <laughs> but these are also fun places to visit um, with your family um, or with your friends. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to um, well, one in the Duran Pitcher Plant Bog, which um, I understand is sometimes pronounced Duran Pitcher Plant Bog. It's a great one to visit that we've heard about this morning. Um, and then uh, coming up on April 11th, the Jones Center is having an open house. So this is an area up near uh, Camilla, that, or I guess it's down near Camilla, that's not open to the public all the time, but it is a gorgeous place to see natural longleaf pine forest and see all that ground cover and the intricacy of that place. Um, and another fun one coming up on Easter Sunday is the Rocks and Rocks Nature Preserve, which is over near Douglas. And it's only open on special occasions, and you can see pitcher plants there too. Um, and so that's a great event where the whole preserve is open. Um, and there's even some, some longleaf pine in there that are so old, they've got those cat faces on them where they were tapped for turpentine. There's a beautiful waterfall, which is unusual for South Georgia. Um, and what else would you want to know? Oh, there's some gorgeous native perennials from there. Queen's being fairy, all kinds of things. So that should get you going if you want to go out and visit some places. Um, and also, if, you're, if you get all riled up after you see these places and you want to start advocating and protecting, uh, there's some good web websites about advocating to have more nurseries grow native plants. So if you can't find it, we've heard about people who are experimenting with native plants and trying to bring more of them to the market. So supporting those kind of endeavors really helps us have more interesting gardens. Um, and then advocating for uh, keeping invasive plants out of that space we all have a bigger buffet to eat from. And that's about what I had to share with y'all today. Do y'all have any questions for me? Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> so the question was, how do you keep that river cane in a restricted area? So similar to how you do bamboo, um, there's a couple ways you do that. So you can dig a trench and put a liner in that trench, like a plastic edging, um, and that will keep it riled, you know, corralled for a little bit. Um, you can also do what my mom does, which is she buries the trash can and puts the cane in the trash can. And so you can't really see that it, it just sticks up a little bit. And you want to, you know, mulch over the edge of that because you don't want to see the trash can in your it. Uh, so those are two ways to do it. Yeah. Not that I know of. I don't know about a clumping variety for that river cane. Okay. So the other the other way to keep it from spreading is have crummy soil. The fruit is edible. Yeah. I've never been lucky enough to find a pawpaw tree with the fruit still on it, but I hope one day to have that happen. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, yes. So Arbor Day Foundation, uh, make sure you checked with your native plant list. And uh, just because it's sold, it's given away by the Arbor Tree Foundation does not mean it's going to work for your area. So you want to double check your list. I have a couple picture books up here if y'all wanted to look at some of the playgrounds we worked with and we get our kids to, the kids, the first graders drawing their own playgrounds and that kind of thing. And there's some business cards up here too. I'll be around if y'all have more questions. Thank you. It was wonderful talking to you.